Whenever God begins to move in the type of way that he's been moving in, really in this church for many, many years, but especially in the last months and leading up to these last few weeks, you will attract attention. You attract attention in the, uh, in one sense, in the kingdom of heaven. You attract attention from people. You also attract attention in the kingdom of darkness. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, I, I really would prefer not to speak on the area that I'm going to speak on tonight. I really would rather speak on another subject, but I just cannot get a, a sense of release in my spirit to do so. So I'm going to talk to us for a few moments about recognizing and responding to a spiritual attack. One author puts it this way. During revival activity or seasons of outpouring of the Spirit of God, that during those times activity increases on both sides of the divide. Many of you have experienced wonderful God activity in your lives in the last few weeks. Some of you have said it to the pastoral staff, and you said it to, to us that you're not the same people that you were just a short eight weeks ago. That you would take a look at your life and you would say, man, I'm not even the same person that I was then. And, and God has been doing some incredible things inside of you. And there will be time for testimonies tomorrow evening. And some of you have been healed by God in these meetings. And physically, you're not the same person. Some of you, your marriages have been touched by God and restored. Some of you have come into the kingdom of God and sin has been forgiven. And, and many, many wonderful things have been taking place. And many of you have experienced some incredible senses of the presence of God in a way in your life that you did not know was possible. That you have been finding yourself moving into his presence in a way, not just in the services. In the services, yes, but beyond that in your home. Where there's just been this incredible sense of the activity of God, the presence of God. And it's been a wonderful season for you. But some of you have also been experiencing what you could call as a spiritual backlash. Indeed, Pastor alluded to it this evening that a moment of a breakthrough in this service where it seems like there has been more attention come from, from, um, from Satan and trying to hinder in some fashion. And I, I really don't even like to address that or talk about that because sometimes I think we give Satan uh, more billing than we give the Lord Jesus. And I much prefer just to come to the house of the Lord and to worship Jesus and exalt Jesus and magnify Jesus and, and just until there's something that breaks through in that way. And if you were here last Friday night, you know, we just had one of those incredible moments at the tail end of the service, or at least what I thought was going to be the tail end of the service. And then it, it just kind of kept going and kept going and kept going. And, and there was an awesome things taking place in this, in this building at the altar. And there was like an incredible breakthrough spiritual that was taking place. So some of you know what it is to have a sense that Satan has tried to sit on your life or sit on a service. Uh, you need to understand uh, that, in, that innocent people can be affected by war. Every war has civilian casualties. You may not feel like you are a combatant, but Satan is not choosy. Civilian casualties do not bother him. So it doesn't bother him one bit to, to see you in a service and just determine I'm, going to, I'm just going to lower my target at them and shoot at them. Now, I don't say that to cause you to be fearful. In fact, I, I want to do three things. I'm going to explore with you from the book of Job how Satan may attack you. And then I want to quickly review the armor that God has given to you to personally deal with the attack that Satan brings against you. In fact, that could be, of course, an entire series of messages. And then intermittent throughout the evening, we're just going to stop and pray for individuals and believe God to give you the breakthrough that you need in your life in that particular situation. Now, let me say right up front, not everything that you are going through in your life that is negative is an attack from the devil. For most of us, Satan is not our biggest problem. Most of us, we ourselves are our biggest problem. We are in Indiana. It is the end of October. Leaves are falling off of trees. When you get hit by a leaf tomorrow, you are not under an attack by the demon of leaves falling. 
What you are experiencing is called autumn. It happens every year at this time. It's a perfectly normal, natural event in Indiana. And so I meet some individuals who really, they talk all the time about Satan's actually doing this, and Satan's that. And in a few cases, I want to say to them, lighten up. Satan is not after you. <laughs> you have not created enough damage in his kingdom for him to even be interested in you. Oh, did he really say that? In fact, let me just say this. I, I don't believe that I have ever personally dealt with Satan. Because as I understand it, Satan is a created being. Meaning he is not omnipresent. Meaning he can only be in one place at a time. So if he's bothering Reinhard Bonnke tonight, he can't be bothering us. You know, if he's bothering Pastor Taylor, then he is not after you at that moment. If he's for after Fred Aguilar and harassing him at the moment, then he is not harassing you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? He's a creative being. Now, he does have a well-organized kingdom. And I do know what it is to deal with demonic spirits. I do know what it is to deal with principalities and powers and, and, and part of the different legions that, that are connected to him. But I don't want to give him any more attention than he deserves to receive. He's a creative being. And by the way, I should probably say this. It's somewhere else in my notes, but I'm going to say it right here. You need to understand that you have Satan outnumbered at every turn. Because the way I read the scripture, it says this. One third of the angels fell. Now, I do not believe that Satan has creative powers because if satan had creative powers he would have created untold numbers of demon spirits he does not have creative powers which means he has exactly the same number of spirits now that he's ever had how many are aware the world's population is larger than it used to be the sheer numbers tells me that satan can't get to everybody but I want you to know this. Even though he has one-third of a very, very powerful force. I mean, one angel put 180,000 people to death in the Old Testament. That's a powerful force. But even though Satan has one-third of them, that tells me this. He's outnumbered two to one. That means that you have the victory that every single situation for every demon that may be coming against you, you have two angels working for you. Now that's good news. You can look happy about that. <laughs> you can look at the person next to you and say, hey, we got them outnumbered. Now just turn to the person next to you and tell them that. We've got them outnumbered. Greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. Most of the time you're not dealing with a power encounter. You're dealing with an information encounter. Because sometimes, you see, one of Satan's best lines is to make you think he's bigger than he is. In fact, as I read the book of Ezekiel, what's going to happen? We actually see Satan, we're going to say this. That? That's what was creating all the problems? You need to understand that. You've got them outnumbered two to one. So I'm going to talk about some of the things he does, but I want to talk about it from the perspective that God's already given you the victory. I want to talk about from the perspective that, that we have more than conquerors to him that loved us. Uh, but I do want you to be aware of some of the ways Satan will attack you. Because if you're not prepared, if you're not aware, and he begins to launch an attack against you, then he can take you out just because you are not expecting the types of things he would do. Okay? So, number one, the anatomy of the spiritual attack in Job. Number one, Satan can... And will attack us and those around us, both our persons 
and our properties. Job chapter 1, verse 10, NIV. Have you not put a hedge? Now, this is a conversation, by the way, between God and Satan, okay? And this is what Satan said to the Lord. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now I want you to notice the following. Everything that happened was father filtered. Satan launches the attack. Let us make it clear we understand uh, the attack came from Satan. But limits were placed by the father. Satan, you may do certain things, but there are certain things you may not do. Now, I understand that in some way, Job's case was a special test between God and Satan. This is not a conversation that takes place every day with every believer. I understand that there was a certain case where God was saying, have you considered my servant Job? And and Satan said, well, no wonder. I mean, your hand's on him, and you bless him, and you put a hedge around him. But if you just take away his property. So God said, okay, here's the deal. You can touch his property. But that's all you can do. And so there were limits on what Satan could do In his attack on Job. It also serves though as an example. Of the way that God operates. And the way Satan operates. Now notice the attack first of all. Involved Job's finances and possessions. He went from wealth to near poverty overnight. Now some business failures are simply market forces. Poor decisions, bad management, poor or unfortunate timing. But some failures are satanic attacks to steal from the child of God. It may be tonight that you need to tell Satan to take his hands off of what doesn't belong to him. John West would have put it this way years ago. He would would not easily credit to Satan the things that would happen around him. But as soon as he would find himself into groupings where it was more than just once, but suddenly a series of unusual events were taking place in his life in relationship to the same thing. I heard pastor say it the other day in a conversation, he calls it clusters. That when suddenly you are aware in your life uh, that there's unusual things taking place in the same area, and it's not just one thing, but it's a repeated thing over and over, it may well be that at that moment you are under a spiritual attack in that area. So let's say strange things begin to happen to your finances. You may be under a spiritual attack uh, in that given area. Now, in Job chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, the attack was extended to Job's family. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at their oldest brother's house. When suddenly, when suddenly a mighty wind swept into the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. The attack was extended to Satan's family. Now, I do not want to create fear, but may I tell you tonight, Satan does not play fair. And he keeps grudges. Look at the person next to you for a moment. Tell them Satan does not play fair. He will seek to attack vulnerable people.
people. Now, that is not to create fear. And I already said it. Satan only has a certain number of spirits who can work for him. And we had them outnumbered two to one. But it would be foolish for us to not understand that Satan will bring attacks against vulnerable people. It's interesting. Maybe that's a poor choice of words. Maybe tragic is a better choice of words. When you become involved in certain types of ministry, and particularly if it gets into the area of people who uh, maybe have gone through horrific sexual abuse, and especially if it's ritualistic sexual abuse. Now, please hear me. Not every person who's in that situation is demonized. But I do find that it's not unusual in that situation to find that not only dealing with the physical or the emotional consequences, often they're also dealing with spiritual consequences. It's like Satan sees a vulnerable person and he strikes out at vulnerable people. So when he sees that you're vulnerable, that's when he goes after you. This is why often you'll, you'll discover many times when there's been a tragic failure morally by a spiritual leader, when you begin to talk to them and research, you'll discover that often it's in a time of extreme busyness. Uh, it was a time of extreme activity taking place in their lives. Uh, they were exhausted, and many times their spiritual uh, devotional life was not at where it had been at other times. Uh, and in a moment of weakness, in a moment of vulnerability, Satan launches his attack against them. Satan will launch his attacks against you when he senses you are vulnerable. Therefore, you have to shut the windows. You've got to decrease those places where you become vulnerable. But this does mean relationship to my family that I need to be sure to cover my family in prayer. Cover them in the blood of Jesus on a regular basis. Pray for them. Sustain them. Wouldn't it hurt mom and dad, grandma and grandpa to visit their bedroom and just as they're sleeping and just release the presence of Jesus into that room. And just begin to release one of those angels, a couple of those angels uh, that already have Satan outnumbered. Just begin to release them uh, to come into that room and ask your father to send ministering spirits uh, who are sent to minister the heirs of salvation. uh, That they would be there and protect uh, that grandbaby of yours and protect that child of yours. Because you see, Satan doesn't play fair. You know, parents, you understand this. Your neighbor can say something about you, and it won't bother you a whole lot. Let him say something about your child. Hello? You know? You you could walk up and slap Pastor Keith. I don't recommend this. You could walk up and slap Pastor Keith. He'd probably turn the other cheek. Maybe. Maybe. But I promise you this, if Nathan was here and you slapped Nathan, he's not turning anything except turning you over his knee or somewhere. Because that would get closer to him than anything you could do to him. Satan cannot touch your father. Because your father's king of kings. Lord of lords. Omnipotent. Ever reigning. Satan already tried to overthrow that throne. The history of it's already been recorded. There was war in heaven and Satan lost. So we're not talking, friend, about fighting to get a victory. This is a mop-up operation. The victory has already been won. We're simply dealing with the last pockets of resistance. But sometimes those last pockets of resistance can be stubborn. And so you're not fighting to get the victory. You already have the victory. But Satan knows he can't touch your father. So he goes after you. Because he knows it hurts your father a whole lot more when he hurts you. He can't touch Jesus anymore. So he goes after you. And he goes after your children. Because, you see, he just wants to inflict pain on somebody. And since he can't touch your heavenly father, he looks around for somebody that's vulnerable. 
But you've been given a spiritual weapon. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And they pull down strongholds. And you can begin to take those weapons, the word of God and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And you can take uh, your testimony. You can take uh, a revelation talks about the love, not the lies unto death. Uh, that's a radical commitment. Uh, and you can begin to use that against the adversary. And you can conquer him. Now in verse 21 and 22 of Job chapter 1, Job begins to show us how to respond when you come under a personal spiritual attack. And when your family comes under spiritual attack. And when your finance comes under spiritual attack. And Job says this. Job, he says, verse 20, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Not in despair. He goes to worship. And he says, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall depart. The Lord gave. The Lord take away. Now listen, I know people could all been out of shape about Job's misunderstanding the theology. I know people could all been out of shape that I know it was Satan. It wasn't the Lord that took it away. Don't get so you know, hung up on that that you miss what I'm trying to say. Job didn't understand what was going on in heaven. You do understand Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Genesis tells us about the beginnings, but Job was written before Genesis. It describes an event before, and so Job has no scripture to go on. The prophets have not begun to declare the word of God yet. So all Job knows is that, that God did this. He didn't know who did it. He's thinking that God did it, but his response is this. I will worship and he says in that, in that, he said, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Now, I'm not going to accuse my heavenly father of stealing stuff. <laughs> he doesn't need your buck 98 that's in your checkbook. <laughs> you know, he, he, honest, heaven is not that close to bankruptcy. <laughs> you know, so, you know, when, you know, Listen, when, when, when you have opportunity, when I have opportunity to give, it's to bless us, not to, you know, heaven's not bankrupt. You know, it's good for us to understand that. So God's not taking, but when Satan comes to take away, Job says, I'm going to worship. You want to drive the devil nuts? He throws everything he can throw at you, and you say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> He's thinking, man, i got to get him down in the dumps. And you're going, oh, isn't he wonderful? You know, you're worshiping. You're loving on Jesus. You're praising the Lord. And Satan's pulling out his hair. Or whatever demon's assigned to you. They're going, what's wrong with these people? Because he learned, I overcome in worship. Job does not charge God with doing wrong. Uh, he worships. He doesn't understand. He says, if the Lord gave it to me and the Lord wants to take it away, he said, that's all right by me. He said, I'm going to worship. Whew. Some of you, your family's been under a spiritual attack. And it's time for you to just say, uh-uh, that's far enough, Satan. You're not, you're not coming any further against my family. They don't belong to you. Take your hands off of them. Amen? In fact, why don't you just stand up with me? We'll just stop here a moment. We're going to pray for people individually later. But some of you have a family member that's under an attack. Some of you have got situations. I will pray for that one individually. I want to start... In fact, I'll just stop right here. If you've got a situation in your finances, you've been faithful in giving. No, don't. Okay, I'm going to offend somebody. But if you are not being faithful in giving, Allah, you've not been you know, giving the tithes to the Lord, then you've removed yourself from God's promise. I always, when people you say, would you pray with me for my finances because I'm under an attack, I will always ask them this, are you tithing? And if they say, well, no, not really, I'm going to say, you know, I'm not going to waste my time praying. 
because the scripture tells me that you're under a curse and so there's no sense me praying until you repent now if you deal with it and you repent uh, then you know then we'll just believe god together right on the spot you know you make the commitment you're going to start right from this moment begin to give back to the lord what he's asked you for said that i'm going to believe god with you and i said but if you're not giving i said then you just remove yourself out from under the umbrella of god's protection you are fair game but you see if you've been giving and you've been obedient, and you're walking with... And by the way, here's another one. Don't blame the devil for stealing your finances if you have wasted it. If you went out this week and spent 500 bucks for bubble gum, that's extreme, isn't it? That's, that way it's safe if I use that one. If you did that, don't blame Satan. It was you. I mean, Eve tried that. She said to the Lord, you know, the, and God, Eve, who bit the stupid fruit? You know, Satan didn't. Who picked it up? Who held it? Who looked at it? Who analyzed it? And who bit it? You see, Satan can make suggestions, but at some point you have to agree with him. If you quit agreeing with him, then you don't, you know, he can't make you do it. He could just suggest it to you that you should do it. Okay, but if you've been faithful in your tithing, then you can say, and, and you've been walking, trying to live with wisdom and, you know, living in a budget, doing all the right things, and you're under an attack, then we're just going to take authority over that right now, okay? So if you just need God, to, somebody said, well, I'm not lifting my hands now because they're going to think I'm, doing, I'm wasting my money. I don't think that, okay, because I know there are people who go under financial attacks. Satan seeks to rob and to steal. He did it to Job. He'll try to do it to you. And if you're in a situation where you sense you've been under a financial attack, I want you just to lift your hand. In fact, once you get out of your seat, just come and stand at the front real quick. If you've been under a financial attack or you have a family member, you've got a family member, just like Job, your family has come under an attack, and you're sensing whether it's your children, whether it's another member of the family that's come under attack, and it is affecting you. What's happening in their life is putting an effect upon you. I want you to come and just stand at the altar. And, and pastoral team, I want you guys to come. And just begin to pray. And you know, I told you just to stretch your hands this way. This could be like totally different, friends, because I'm not trying to press you with the message. We want some people, moment by moment, just set free tonight, okay? To walk out of this building set free. She can da 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 She can just stretch your hands this way. Father, Linda, why don't you come? Sister Karen, why don't you come? Begin to lay hands on some of these friends. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we're going to take authority over Satan. Now, Father, we're not going to give him credit. Lord, we're going to worship you. We're going to take the same mindset that Job took. We're going to, we're going to worship you. We're going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. But in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I speak to every demonic force that's come to rob my brothers and my sisters. I speak to those greedy spirits that have put their hands on something that doesn't belong to them. I address demon spirits tonight that have tried to rob, tried to steal, tried to take jobs away from God's people, have tried to destroy reputations of God's people so that they will lose their employment. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to those spirits and I tell you that the Lord is against you and in the name of Jesus you'll take your hands off of what does not belong to you you do it now in Jesus name now in the name of Jesus we take authority over every effort of the adversary to destroy family in the name of Jesus, I cover every son and every daughter. In the name of Jesus, I cover every granddaughter and every grandson with the blood of Jesus Christ. I cover them now. I cover them now. I cover them now. In the name of Jesus, I cover them now. All the way down here at the end. I cover them now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I cover that vulnerable grandchild that vulnerable grandchild 
granddaughter. In the name of Jesus, Satan, you would try to get your hooks into them through the internet. You would try to get your hooks into them through many different ways in media. But Satan, in the name of Jesus, I take authority against that. And I bind that attack that you would put against that child, against that son or that daughter to begin to cause them to be exposed to things that will destroy their lives. And in Jesus' name, take your hands off of my child. Take your hands off of my grandchild. The Lord rebukes you. The Lord rebukes you. We declare His Word against you. We worship our Heavenly Father. We worship our Lord. And Satan, we say to you, uh, you will not touch uh, our children or our property. They do not belong to you. They belong to the Lord. We've dedicated them to Him. We've committed them to Him. And they belong to Him. In the name of Jesus. At the altar, I want you to linger as long as you want to. In the auditorium, you can be seated if you would like. We'll see if we can do two things at one time. The next satanic attack on Job was on his body. Job chapter 2, verse 4. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch your hand and strike his flesh and bones. He will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then can Father filter. He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Now you're going to hear this refrain over and over from me tonight. Not every sickness is a direct attack from Satan. Some sickness is my folly. Failing to dress for the conditions, for example. I've seen them football games in December, you know, January, and there's some idiot in sub-zero weather without a shirt on. And he wonders why he comes down with something, you know. That is not, that was not a satanic attack. That was an attack of stupidity. And there's no cure for that. Some sickness... Is simply the result of our living in a fallen world. You know, some people are always trying to blame somebody for being sick. Some sickness happens because you happen to be living in a world that's been contaminated by sin, and there's fallout of that. And you happen to be living in that. Some sickness is a genetic situation. You inherited it. Call it whatever you want to call it, but it's still true. But there are some who are under a direct physical attack. Satan is a thief and he's a destroyer. And the fact is this. If he was not under restraint, he would kill you right now. Well, some of you wouldn't. Some people, he's better off if he doesn't touch them. Because they create enough chaos in the kingdom of heaven that he's really glad to have them out moving right along. I had a guy tell me, he said, I never had so many problems till I got saved. And I said, your problems, you have a bad memory. He said, I remember what you were like before you got saved and you were a disaster looking for a place to happen. But there is some Things that are attacks from Satan. Now listen, you have a promise from God's word regardless of the source of the sickness. You, may, maybe, maybe what you're dealing with is you can look back and say, you know, I did some things that weren't all that smart. You know, some of you live for years abusing your body. 
And there's results that have come. But you know what? God is merciful and God is gracious. And He heals. He heals. I was talking, I was with a man, a pastor, I have a pastor of a church I had gone to minister to this man who was dying. And they wanted the pastor to do the funeral. First time he'd ever met them. And I had gone with him to make this visit. And, and the man's lifestyle for years had led to him contracting a particular disease. And he was dying from the disease. And, uh, and, and we led the man to Jesus. And then the pastor and his wife went off in the other room to make arrangements for the funeral. And I said to this man, you know, this same Jesus that just came into your life has been known to heal people. Would you like me to pray for you and ask him to heal you? Like, what's he got to lose, right? You know. So he says, well, sure. And so I prayed for him. And they did have a funeral 10 years later. Total different situation. He lived to an old age and went to be with Jesus. So he had a lifestyle. But Jesus stepped in and redeemed it. That's what he does. I've seen him heal AIDS victims who their AIDS came as a direct result of activity that they knew was disobedient to God's word. He heals. And he heals situations that are genetic. It may have been in your family line, but he heals. And he heals conditions that just happen because you you got in the wrong line at the supermarket and there was somebody next to you and you didn't realize and you took home with you something you did not intend to take home with you. My wife and I fly a lot. And you know, there's stuff that goes around on airplanes. And uh, so sometimes you just are exposed to stuff. You can ask God to heal you. You can ask God to protect you. You know, we just do that on a regular basis. You can ask God to do that. But some of you also are under a direct attack from Satan physically. Now, whether you're under attack from Satan or something else, but you just need the Lord to heal you. Would it be okay if we just ask him to do that? How many think it would be okay with you if we just asked Jesus to heal some people tonight? If you need healing, why don't you get up out of your seat and just come and stand at the front? You need the Lord to heal you. Why don't you just come and stand at the front? And I don't care whether it's a temporary situation or whether you're dealing with something that you have fought for a long time. You just need healing. And you don't have to be under a physical attack from Satan. You just maybe need healing, but you may be under direct physical attack. So we're just going to ask the Lord to heal you tonight. We're just going to ask Him to do it. He's a, he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's, that's how He describes Himself. You see, healing is just a part of His nature. It's almost like He can't help Himself. That's been so much of what's happened in these last few weeks as we've just been worshiping Him. It's like He comes, and when He comes, He forgets, you know, and just starts healing people because that's who He is. There have been nights when the anointing has just been really strong and pastors trying not to be totally lost. And He say to me, don't get too close because there's just something that, you know, that's taking place in the presence of the Lord. But tonight, friends, I want you to let Jesus get really close to you. And you get really close to Him. And let His presence, let His presence begin to minister to you. In fact, for a few moments, I don't want you thinking about your sickness. Okay? I don't want you thinking about the condition. I know that's not easy to do because... We get focused on our condition. I understand that. Can we for a few moments just get focused on him? Because you see, Job responds the same way here. When he's under this attack, he begins to worship the Lord. And so could you just lift your hands for a a few moments right where you're at? And could you just begin to love Jesus? Linda, why don't you come and join the pastoral staff and get ready to pray for people? Mm-hmm. 
we worship you Lord Father this is not about a system Lord it's not just Lord I don't have any plan these are your children and Father your children have need some of them Lord they, they've got genetic situations we'd like to ask you to step in and rearrange their genetics oh, rearrange the DNA and I speak in the name of Jesus I speak to genetic situations things inherited in the family bloodline in the name of Jesus I release into your bloodline a greater blood the blood of Jesus But Lord, I specifically am going to ask, Lord, that you would touch every person who's come under a physical attack from the enemy of their soul. Lord, at one level, Satan is behind every sickness. At one level, he's behind every sickness. That's what he does. But we lay hands on our friends now and in the name of of Jesus Christ Father I ask you to release healing now 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 there 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 behold 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 now be made well (laughs) Jesus Christ makes you whole sir yeah right there pastor oh Jesus makes you well sir now whoa let him do it it's thick in here Jesus now Jesus, oh, lover, lover of my soul, maker of our bodies. Woo. Spirit of God's all over her. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Jesus, mm. let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Jesus, words aren't enough there. to tell of there. your love. On the internet, just lay hands on yourself. Just lay hands on yourself right now. Scripture does not say who has to lay hands on you. Internet right now, just lay hands on yourself. Maybe lay your hands on that part of the body where you're in physical pain. 
And Father's my friend who's watching from wherever they're watching this meeting. Father, I'm asking, I'm asking right now, Father, that you would release healing right there. In the name of Jesus, be made whole. Yes, yes, in the name of Jesus. Shh. Oh. Mm. Mm. Jesus. Not afraid. Jesus. Not afraid. Shh. Healing rain's falling down. It's falling down. So Satan will attack your family. He will attack your property. He will attack your physical body. But here's another way that he attacked Job. If you're at the altar, you can just stay here if you want to. You can go to your seat. You can stay up at the altar. You can sit on the altar bench. I really don't care. But here's what Job said in Job chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, New Living Translation. Listen, if they're out in the spirit, leave them there. If you're on the floor, stay there. If you're on the floor, stay there. I have no difficulty preaching around people on floors. I've done that. New Living Translation, Job 6, verses 8 through 10. This is Job speaking. Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me my hope, I wish he would crush me. I wish he would reach out his hand and kill me. At least I could take comfort in this. Despite the pain, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Here's what I want you to see. Job was so depressed, he wanted to die. Satan attacks you by bringing depression on your emotions. Now, please hear me. Some depression is clinical. Some is physical. I've had family members who went through depression that was probably related to an overload on their emotions and their stress. But some depressive thoughts that have come out of nowhere are satanic in origination. Some of you have found yourself wanting to die, perhaps even to commit suicide. And you wonder, where has that thought come from? But suddenly you find the thought is there. In a moment, I want to pray with you, but I'm going to lump a couple of other things in with that soon as well. But if you have been under an emotional attack where you just wanted to die, that's where Job was. So I just want you to crush me, kill me. He said, get it over with. It's an attack. In verse 21 of the same chapter, Job says this. Now you too have proved to be of no help. You see something dreadful and are afraid. This is an area of relationships. Some satanic attacks will come in the area of your relationships. You see, what's happened is this. Job's friends have brought inaccurate charges against Job. Some of you have faced accusations from others. They have said things about you that are not true. They have assumed motives that were not true. They've assumed that you meant certain things from a motive that was not in your mind. I'm not saying that your friends are demons. Do not misunderstand me. I am saying that sometimes Satan will use words from your friends to try to destroy you. They become unwittingly his verbal mouthpiece. Now, the solution is not to attack your friends. But the attack left Job feeling isolated. 
and alone. His friends have come to help him. But now they are leveling charges against him. And he's felt let down by them. Some of you are dealing with feelings of extreme isolation and extreme loneliness. The people you have counted on have failed you. The people that you thought you could trust have let you down. Someone wrote the other day, he said, I thought those who knew me would know better than to think that I would think that. And dealing with pain because of the things that others have said. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. Don't become bitter against your friends. They didn't understand. My, my father tells the story as a young man in the church getting a hamburger after service with a bunch of young people. And a young lady sitting at the table says to him, I like to hear everybody in the church sing except you. Destroyed him. She never intended to destroy him. But from that day to the day my father died, 40 years later, he never sang another solo. I heard him sing a duet with my mother one time in the last year of his life. I heard him one time sing with my mother and another couple in a quartet. That's it. My dad did not have a bad voice. But he was crushed by something somebody said. Some of you have been crushed. Now, some of you people have tried to crush you with the things they've said. But most of the time, you know, if you know they're trying to destroy you, it doesn't bother you. What really tears you apart is those things that somebody said and they didn't even realize the devastation they were bringing into your life. They thought they were your friend and you thought they were your friend, but something was said. You need to learn how to allow the Lord to become your strength. Learn how to allow others to pick you up. Now, some of you may need to be more careful as to who your friends are. And especially what types of things you say to them. I, I better not go down that track. Let me be a fifth type of attack because it's in the same emotional area. It's found in Job chapter 7 verses 3 and 4. Job chapter 7 verse 3. So I have been allotted months of futility and nights of misery have been assigned to me. When I lie down, I think, how long before I get up? The night drags on, and I toss till dawn. Verse 7, remember, O Lord, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. Job is experiencing feelings of hopelessness. He feels like it's futile. Life is full of misery with no evidence that it's ever going to get better. When you are feeling like it's totally hopeless, you are probably under a satanic attack. You see, God has programmed us to be people of faith and hope and love. That's how God made you. He made you to have hope. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. That's how you were structured by God. You are not structured to be a morose individual. You were structured by God to be a person of hope. You were structured by God to be a person of faith. You were structured by God to be a person who loved and was capable of receiving love. The complete absence of hope may be a sign that you are under a satanic attack. So some of you, you're feeling, dealing with depression. Some of you are dealing with feelings of, 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 of pain and misery because you've been hurt by the words of others. Friends have let you down. Some of you are at a point in your life that you're feeling totally hopeless. 
is the man that said to me one day, it's always been this way and it will always be this way. Hopeless. That's a satanic attack to cause you to feel hopeless in your life. Let me give you another one. All of these are related. The next level of attack is found in the 20th verse of this 7th chapter. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Now here's what's happening. Satan is suggesting to Job that Job has become God's target. Go ahead, Job. Just blame God for what's happening in your life. That's what Satan is saying. He's saying, Job, God doesn't love you. Just God's the reason you're in this situation. Satan wants to remove you from the awareness of God's love for you. He wants you to think that God is against you. You're not sure why, but you know God loves somebody else more than he loves you. You just know it. You're, 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 you know, some of you grew up in a situation where you thought you, one of your parents loved your brother more than he loved you. Loved your sister more than she loved you. Some of you may have had a parent that told you that. And Satan has used that to suggest to you that God doesn't love you. And that thing that comes into your mind is a direct satanic attack. And to Job is saying, what have I done? Is that you watcher of men, that you made me your target. Now, Job knew he wasn't God's target, but he felt like it. You see, there are things that we know with our heads, but our heart is not in agreement. You know God loves you. If I were to walk around this room and to put the microphone in front of you and ask you if you believe that God loved you, 90% of us conservatively would say, oh, I know he loves me. But some of us tonight are struggling. And we secretly have this feeling that God just really doesn't like me. I don't know why God shows favors, but he likes them better than he likes me. That's a satanic attack. Because there's all sorts of things Satan's trying to do with that. He's trying to drive a wedge between you and your heavenly father. He's trying to drive a wedge between you and that brother or that sister. He's trying to create a jealous spirit inside of you that will destroy you. Let me give you one more. Job chapter 9. Verse 27 and 28. Job 9, 27 and 28. This is Job speaking. If I say, I will forget my complaint. I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings. I know you will not hold me innocent. Job is fighting to keep a positive mental attitude. He says, if I forget my complaint, he says, I, I say, I'm going to forget my complaint. I'm going to change my expression. I'm going to smile anyway. And he cannot stay positive no matter how hard he tries. If you are normally a positive person, but no matter how hard you're trying to stay positive, you cannot do it, then you are probably under a satanic attack. If you are normally an upbeat, positive individual in life, but now you're at a point you say, no matter what I say to myself, no matter how much I speak to myself, no matter how much I talk to myself, no matter how much I quote stuff to myself, I just can't stay on top of it. You're probably under a satanic attack. What are you to do with all of this? Well, we're going to minister to this last group in a moment. 
But we've been given spiritual armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And time will not permit a long exposition. Let me just give you this real quickly. You're given a belt of truth. Now this speaks first of all to me that Jesus is truth. So put on the Lord Jesus. So get intimate with Jesus. Get close to Him. Get so close to Him that you're hearing His voice instead of the voice of the accuser. You see, one of the things marriage counselors will tell you in helping a husband and a wife who've got a problem in the relationship is you tell them you've got to move toward each other and not away from each other. Now, when you're moving away from each other, you are not solving the situation. If I have, I'll just pick you, sis, just to pick on somebody. If I have a struggle in my relationship with you, I'm not going to resolve my relationship with you by going over here. I've got to move toward you. Move toward Jesus. Move toward Jesus. Move toward Jesus. Now this also speaks to me of integrity, personal integrity. When Satan begins to speak, I know I have lived with integrity. Somebody said, how do you know when Satan is lying? When his lips are moving. Okay, that's how you know. So if his lips are moving, he is telling you a lie. Put on the belt of truth. Number two, you're given the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. I stand complete in God. 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 Look at the person next to you and say, I stand complete in God. You stand complete in God. Why? Because of what Jesus has done. I come before the Father because of what Jesus has done. I am righteous. Why? Because he said so. So it doesn't really matter what Satan thinks. Because he said, you're righteous. You know, I really like people to like my preaching rather than dislike my preaching. Over the years, I met a few who didn't really care much for my preaching. But there's a young lady here in the front row. And if she likes my preaching, I don't really care what the rest of the world thinks. You know? If she says, wow, that was good. You know, if you didn't like it, that's your problem. You need to know what the love of your soul says about you. He says he's crazy about you. He says, I gave you my righteousness. I gave it to you. So when Satan comes to say to you, well, you are this. No, no. He gave me his righteousness. Your feet are shod with peace. Jesus has given you his peace. He said, my peace I give to you. It's a gift. I'm giving you, he said, my peace. Receive it. Accept it. That's your peace. That's a gift. You get close to him, he can give you his peace. Number four, you have a shield of faith. This shield is especially designed to extinguish flaming arrows from the evil one. Use that shield of faith. When Satan starts sending those arrows of criticism your way, those barbs uh, your direction, he starts speaking your mind and depressing you and telling you all these things and says God doesn't care for you, extinguish those with the shield of faith. Then you've been given a helmet of salvation. You've been given salvation. Huh. It affects everything if you've been given salvation. And the helmet covers the head, the mind, 
bring your mind under the control of the Word of God. What does He say? Pick up the sword of the Spirit. That's God's Word. Use the Word of God against Satan. You know, the devil is not all that impressed with what I have to say. But he is scared to death of what Jesus had to say. I was in a cleansing stream retreat one time. I was on the line praying for people. And, I, you know, looking back, I know it was the Spirit of God. But at the moment, I didn't know what possessed me. But I'm dealing with this situation when there's this, there's this spirit of murder inside of this individual on this whatever you want to call it this person was being spirit of murder attached to this person and we're dealing with and it was just you know it was not going to come out and I heard myself say this I didn't plan this and I said you either come out now or I'm going to get the sword of the spirit against you what followed was a panic scream no not the sword Phew, gone The word scares him. So take out your sword. Some of you, you know, got it stuck in your sheath really good. Take the sword out. I know people that, you know, they'll get the Bible out and they'll, they'll lay it on their chest before they go to bed at night. That's cute. That's, that's cool. Better yet, put it in your head. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. That's the last thing he says in Ephesians. There's something about praying in the Holy Spirit. Oh, it really is. It really is. I try to pray in the Spirit at least one hour every day. Just, it's been for years. It's part of the practice of my life at least. I was driving by myself from Auckland, New Zealand to Wellington, New Zealand, about an eight, nine hour drive. And I just, I just decided to see what would happen if I would pray in the spirit the whole way. You know, by the end of that trip, I was looking for the devil so I could kick him. Something about praying in the spirit. And giving a weapon. Stand with me, please. Because we're going to give an invitation a moment for those that... You, you, you identified with all of this on the emotional side. You're dealing with depression. You're dealing with feelings of hopelessness. You've heard the accuser say things, and people have, have become unwittingly used by the adversary, and they have said things that have left deep pain inside of you. It seemed hopeless to you. We walked all of this last stuff, and we're going to minister to you. But before we pray, please know this, and please listen to me. If you tuned out, good time to tune in. Please understand this. You only receive the promise of the Lord's protection when you are in His family. Remember when Jesus said to somebody once, you are of your Father the devil when you're in somebody's family you come under their protection so if you're in the devil's family you're under his jurisdiction you're under his authority and he can pretty well do to you whatever he wants to do because you're in his family Now, there will be times that God will intervene, and even in that situation, he'll say, Satan, this far, no farther. But pretty much, if you're living in Satan's family, Satan's got rights. You see, what you need to understand, and I need to understand, is God respects. God respects decisions. When Adam and Eve made a decision so many years ago to rebel against God, and they brought sin into the world, God respected their decision, even though God knew the consequences. And so if you choose to live in the devil's family, God will respect that. And you come under Satan's. So here's what you need to do. Change families.
And that's not hard to do because the Father wants to welcome you. He wants to adopt you into His family. And when you're adopted into His family, you have the same rights and privileges as every other member of the family. So if you're, you're not yet a member of the family of God, you're an open target, but today the Lord wants to help you. And if you come over to His side, He'll extend His protection to you. If you come over to the Lord's side by saying, Lord, I am sorry that I have not been living for you. I've been living in sin. I've been doing things, Lord, that were disobedient to you. Lord, I, I broke your word. I broke your heart. And Lord, I'm sorry. And would you forgive me? And Lord, would you come into my life? Listen, the only thing the thief on the cross prayed was this, remember me. That's it. That, you know, that's all he prayed. You see, he didn't have to get all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Jesus reads the heart really well. And when you come and say, help. Lord, I want on your side. He says, I want you on my side. And he'll forgive. And, and, and you change families. And you know what? When you change families... Jesus then says to Satan, you're losing your rights here. You're losing your rights here. They're not mine. Now, Satan's a thief. How many know that a thief does not have the right to what is in your house? How many know he'll try to take it anyway? So Satan does not have the right any longer when you come into the family of God, but he'll try to take it anyway. That's the attack. But when you're in God's family, you've been given supernatural help against the attacks of the wicked one. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? In a moment, I'm going to give an invitation for those in this room that you've been under, you're under that attack from Satan in the area of your emotions, in the area of, of, of the criticism, in the area of the feelings of hopelessness. You have felt like the target of God. And you feel like, what's God have against me? And you would never say that, but you feel it. In a moment, I'm going to give you an invitation to come to the front. But right now, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to take the next few moments to speak to those in this room that you are not yet in the family of God. May I tell you, we, we care more than that Jesus cares. May I tell you that the Lord wants you in His family and we want you in His family and we want you in our spiritual family. One of the reasons these meetings are continuing is because we are here to help you to come to know Jesus. So wherever you're at in this auditorium tonight or you may be watching on the internet, I want you to have an opportunity tonight to make a decision that says, I'm going to change families. I'm going to leave Satan's family behind. And I'm going to ask the Lord, I'm going to ask the Heavenly Father to make me His child. I promise you, He wants to. Now, heads about and eyes are closed. Just say, Michael, that's me. You're talking to me right now. I am not a member of God's family. I've not been living my life for Jesus but tonight I want to make a decision that I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ I want to move away from Satan's family and his authority and I want to live in God's family wherever you're at in this auditorium friend nobody else is moving would you do this for me would you put your hand in the air where I could see it would you raise your hand where I could see it and then look at me until your eyes and my eyes make connection because God wants to forgive you tonight. He wants to forgive you. Sis, he wants to forgive you. Young man, he wants to forgive you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause a moment here before we pray for others. Because this is the most important thing that I could do this evening is give you an opportunity to know. Is that you? You can be forgiven tonight, okay? Now, in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to have people come who are under that satanic attack, and I want you to come when they come, okay? And I want to pray with you. Will you let me do that? Okay, how many others? 
Just slip your hand up and look at me. God bless you. God bless you. Okay, everybody just look at me. Now, all across the auditorium, just look at me. There is no way that we're going to pray the one prayer tonight that will keep you from ever coming under a spiritual attack. But when you come under a spiritual attack, you can overcome it. You see, I know what it is to come under spiritual attacks. I tell people at this point in the time in my life, I, I at least recognize it sooner. You expect to go three or four days before I realize what was happening. Now, usually within the first few minutes, I say, uh-huh, I recognize that. I know what it is. It's a spiritual attack on my mind, on my emotions, you know, whatever area it may be. And if these last four points that I mentioned, because they were, they're all interconnected, they were related, but the deal where so much of us live our life at the deep roots, our emotions, and you, you have been under an attack in that area. You have been dealing with depression, and it's not, it's not because of stress. It's, it's just you're dealing with depression. You're finding yourself thinking thoughts of, of, of ending life or just wishing life would be over. And God didn't make you to be that way. You're, you're feeling feelings of futility, of hopelessness. And you're normally a pretty positive, upbeat person. You're just feeling so hopeless. It's never going to be any better. You're under a spiritual attack. You're, you're in a situation where the words that others have said, you feel the pain. You watch others. They, like Job's friends, you've been hurt by the things others have said. And you're carrying the pain of that. It's an attack on you. You feel, at the feeling level, you begin to feel like God has something against you. He doesn't care for you. You, you wouldn't verbalize that, but that's, that's what you're dealing with. That's what Job was at. God, why, why, why are you attacking me for? And Satan has been saying to you, God doesn't love you. He's been saying to you, there's something wrong in your life. It's time to get that attack off of you. It's time to get those attacks off of you, amen? So if what I've just shared, if that's where you're at, would you get out of your seat? And would you come and begin to stand at the front? And we're going to pray for you. We'll see you set free. You lifted your hand on the salvation. I want you to come at the same time. Come on. You've been under one of those attacks emotionally, mentally. Satan's been telling you that you're worthless. He's been telling you that you're worthless. Let me tell you, you're not worthless. The highest price that could be paid was paid for you. You see, the value of an object is determined by the price one is willing to pay for it. And Jesus paid the ultimate price for you. That's the value He places on you. That's the value He places on everyone standing at this altar tonight. That's the value He places on you. Now I need members of the staff, if you're not standing at the altar to receive prayer, I need you to come. Again, to minister to these. In fact, could you take a step forward? Everybody that's at the altar, could you take a step forward? Because I want there to be room for some people to get in behind you. And church, here's what I'm going to ask you to do tonight. Now, I know I've been, I preached like way too long tonight. But I'm going to ask you if you would do this. Would you come and just stand behind your brothers and sisters? Satan said, to the Lord, you put a hedge around Job and I can't get to him. I love that because the Lord never denies it. It was the truth. He had put a hedge around him. I love to pray hedges. I love, you know, years ago, somebody, somebody came up to me prophetically and they said, you're, you're losing your intercessors because Satan is picking them off. He said, you need to start praying a hedge around them. And we started doing that. From that moment on, we started praying regularly a hedge around the intercessors. And I watched the spiritual attacks drop off. Huge difference. We just started putting a hedge around them. 
So we're going to put a hedge around you. In fact, as these friends are standing behind you, they're just putting a hedge right now. Just putting a hedge around you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we're going to lay hands on these friends and we're going to, and we're going to ask you to set them free, but I just put a hedge around them. Satan, I speak to you. I speak to every lie that you put into their hearts. Satan, you lying spirit, you accusing spirit, how dare that you would make accusations about my father to his children. How dare, spirit, you would accuse him of the things you've accused him of. We call you out. We tell you that you are a liar. And we've caught you. And in the name of Jesus, stop it now. In the name of Jesus, I speak to the spirits of depression to be lifted. In the name of Jesus, we speak to every suicidal thought. Who? In the name of Jesus, we speak to every death wish thought to begin to go. In the name of Jesus, we speak to every spirit of hopelessness. Go! In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus.